source project track. Uh, lunch was awesome, so uh, I'm feeling good. I'm really excited to uh, introduce this collaboration of HP and uh, Rackspace that, uh, I mean, this project's been going on as long as OpenStack, I feel like, and iterating and becoming a, a really first, first class solution for uh, database as a service, and it's an essential uh, component of, of a cloud solution. So I'll let you guys continue the introduction, but uh, thank you very much. Okay. All right, so I am uh, Vipul Sabaya. I work for HP Cloud. Um, I'm the technical lead for the Red Dwarf project at HP. And I'm Tim Simpson. I'm a developer at Rackspace, and I'm working on cloud database. So uh, first off, thanks everyone for coming out here. Um, it's heartening to see so many people here, uh, you know, to learn more about Red Dwarf. We've been working on this project for a long time. Uh, it means a lot to us. Getting it into the open means a lot to us. And so we're glad that, you know, if, if you already know a little bit about Red Dwarf, uh, we're going to talk about the history today, and we're going to talk about the current status of where it's at and where our efforts are at to get it into the public. Um, we're going to go over the architecture a bit, and we're also going to talk about how we're leveraging Nova and the rest of OpenStack to build this service. So if you're building some sort of orchestration layer, it might be interesting to you as well. All right, so back in 2011, Rackspace was starting on cloud database as a service. And the idea at the time was that we were gonna be using OpenVZ and creating MySQL applications inside OpenVZ containers. Um, you know, when we started it, we kind of thought, oh, this is a different sort of than cloud servers. We're not just gonna put a database on it. This is sort of something fundamentally different. Uh, and we started building an application in Java that used um, frameworks like uh, Service Mix and Zookeeper. And one day, the lead of uh, Red Dwarf, Mike Bassnight, was talking to some people who worked on Nova. And he realized that they had uh, a method for sending RPC calls. And we needed a method for RPC calls. And they were building a scheduler. And we were about to have to build a scheduler. And so he looked at this and he said, well, geez, it makes no sense to be uh, reinventing the wheel when Nova's doing all this stuff that we could, is very useful for our project as well. So um, that day, that's sort of when Red Dwarf was born. We decided we were going to fork Nova and we were gonna start building database as a service on top of it. And you know, I got to work that day and we just passed this big milestone. And so I hear, okay, everything's changed. It's all Python now. We're all, we're going to OpenStack. And so we sort of have a joke on the team, like whenever we get back from vacation and someone says, you won't believe what happened. We'll say, what, did we rewrite everything in Perl? Uh, but that said, it, it's been really fun. It's been really fun learning Python and uh, learning sort of how all of OpenStack operates. And it was ultimately for the best. So we went to the Diablo Summit and we announced what we were doing. And uh, that's when we met HP. Okay. Uh, so HP, uh, we had deployed OpenStack um, essentially and we're looking to build services on top of uh, OpenStack at that point. So we wanted to build value added services, things like database services, things like messaging services. And you know, uh, we wanted to make sure that it was using OpenStack. It was built on top of OpenStack, and it provided you know other services that are core to OpenStack. Um, one of the things that we're looking for is that we we wanted something that aligned with OpenStack's visions as well as goals, um, and also performance. So um, you know, databases are different from other types of applications. They have specific performance requirements, and uh, you know, one of those things is consistency. Consistency in I/O, consistency in read throughput, write throughput. So. Red Dwarf was one of those solutions that sort of gave us the flexibility to uh, get to that consistency. And the final point is open source. So we wanted to build something that we could push back to the community, um, that we could have community participation in, and you know, Red Dwarf fit the bill. Okay, so we announced Red Dwarf at the Diablo Summit. Um, we joined forces with HP at the next summit. And HP runs uh, Nova sort of like a black box. like. The way we roll it out at Rackspace, we have control over Nova, but HP is a bit different. And when they were talking to us, they said, hey, we like these ideas, but we really think that it shouldn't be a fork. We think it should be something separate. It should talk to Nova like a black box. And the more we talked to them and we were you know, looking over our own architecture, we started to realize that makes a lot of sense. Like we really, this shouldn't be a fork anymore. And so we started work on Red Dwarf Lite um, to rewrite those parts of Red Dwarf so they can talk to OpenStack completely independently. And we did a small presentation at the last summit, if anyone saw that, about using Red Dwarf to sort of talk to Nova. And so since that time, um, Rackspace is actually, our, our cloud database uh, service is in GA, and HP is on the cusp of um, 
public data. data. So both of these are actually being used by customers. So uh, now let's see where, where we are today. So uh, to back up a little bit, what exactly is like Red Dwarf? Red Dwarf is the treatment of the MySQL application like a first class citizen in OpenStack. Um, it, it takes sort of MySQL and it makes it uh, the same way uh, the first class citizen like with a cloud server or anything else. So there's a rich set of APIs for manipulating MySQL applications. So you can create, uh, delete them. Um, and when you do this, you, you get access to it. You can give access to a, a user who can log in like they own that uh, application themselves. Uh, and then there's some extensions. Um, at Rackspace, we have extensions for uh, creating and deleting databases and users. And in HP, they have some extra stuff for snapshots. Mm -hmm. But we're all, the core is, is the same. And uh, we just use extensions for those small differences. Yeah, one of the things I wanted to point out is, you know, we both have different approaches. So HP, we provide root access to the end user. So we didn't really need these things where we, you know, do whatever you could do in MySQL, such as creating a user, creating a database, we decided, hey, let the user do that through root. Um, Rackspace has a different approach. And at the same time, you know, even though we have different approaches, we're able to leverage Red Dwarf um, to, you know, meet that common goal. There's a question. This is really based, uh, we're starting with MySQL. Right? So the core of Red Dwarf, you could potentially run other applications as well. Uh, Mike Basson gave a talk at the last summit where he actually showed people standing up um, PHP and some other technologies using the same underlying uh, methods. Now all that code is just sort of in a fork that he made experimentally, but in theory this could be used to stand up all sorts of things. Yeah, exactly. So right now the focus is on MySQL, but mm -hmm. it totally has potential there for that sort of thing. So here's the architecture of Red Dwarf. And if you look at it, it sort of, will, it looks like a little version of the Nova architecture, right? In Nova you have various daemons like Nova Compute, uh, Nova Network, and they're talking mm -hmm. to an infrastructure database and over a message bus uh, to communicate to each other. Well, Red Dwarf looks very similar, and um, that's not an accident. Uh, it looks that way because, of course, we started as a fork of Nova, but it's also because we want to be as close to Nova as we can. We want this to be a very comfortable environment for people who are used to OpenStack. So um, we have our own uh, infrastructure database and message bus that we talk to. And one of the, one of the few differences is that um, the Red Dwarf API and Task Manager communicate to the Nova API to get um, information on compute instances because a MySQL instance in Red Dwarf is really a compute instance plus the status of the MySQL application inside it as determined by a guest. So when you issue a call to create a MySQL application instance, um, what you actually do is you, Red Dwarf will provision a new uh, compute instance with an image on it that actually has a guest inside. When the, in, when the instance wakes up, the guest starts receiving messages over the message queue and will basically check the status of MySQL. And when MySQL is confirmed to be active, that's when the user sees the status of active and they know it's okay to use their database. So at Rackspace, um, we have things just a little bit different from the uh, reference implementation. So our version of Nova is a little, is uh, we've tweaked it a bit. We're using OpenVZ for the virtualization. So we actually, rather than uh, provisioning VMs, we're uh, provisioning OpenVZ uh, containers. And instead of provisioning normal ones, we, we added a, a driver for HP Fangear that we're using. And both of those are things that we're, we're hoping to open source. Um, in addition, the guest agent, uh, we use an agent written in C++. We decided to make the reference agent uh, based with Python because people didn't really want to mess with C++ and building it all. So that's, that's another minor difference. Okay, uh, so at HP, uh, the picture looks very similar. A um, couple of changes here. So the backend service, our backend service is actually swapped out with a Java-based backend service. So we have this application server that can you know, do things like uh, an orchestration layer that has an orchestration layer built in. The other difference is that we have an agent that um, is Python-based. We're not using the C++ agent, we're using a Python agent. Uh, the main thing to note here is that Nova is a black box to us. So we talk to Nova purely via the public endpoint. Um, what that means is we don't actually share anything with Nova. We don't share the message bus. We don't share the database. We have separate instances of everything for Red Dwarf. 
And the other piece that comes into the picture here is, uh, is Swift. We make heavy use of Swift. Uh, it's used to store our customer database backups. Um, essentially, we're also using features in Swift, such as ACLs, to make sure that you know snapshots are stored securely within Swift. Okay, so the status of this. Um, both of these services are in production right now. Uh, you can go to either of our company's uh, websites and you can start using these today. So this you know, technology, it's, it's not really theoretical. We're, we actually have launched on this. So the status of the code and the open source efforts. Right now, the API code is shared. If you provision a MySQL instance on either s company service, you're gonna be going through the same code path. Um, the, we use extensions where necessary, but even those, many of those are in the public right now. For, we also strive to uh, have RPC compatibility. So when we send a message from the API daemon to the task manager, we want that to be compatible with the way HP is doing it, with their Java backend. Uh, similarly, for the guests, we want to make sure that those RPC calls are the same as well. And um, finally, there's open source versions of the guest and the uh, backend in case you want to pull this down and play with it today. Okay, so we're talking about you know APIs, API compatibility. So you know one of the things that HP and Raxos are both committed to is the core API for Red Dwarf. Um, so we're working, you know, we're collaborating with one another to come up with that core API, and we want to make sure that the API also follows OpenStack standards. So you know it, when you use it, it should look like Nova, it should feel like Nova, it should feel like other you know APIs within OpenStack. Um, so you know we're, we're working hard to make sure that that happens. Uh, both companies are also committed to the same CLI, and it's that CLI is called Python Red Dwarf Client. You can go and actually get that today. Um, this CLI, is, you know, if, if you were to use that today, you could point it to Raxos, it would work. It would, if you point it to HP, it would also work, you know, just the same. Um, we're also doing some work with JCloud to get some Java support uh, for Red Dwarf, um, and we're, we're trying to get a patch into JCloud here pretty soon that'll give us that support. So, leveraging OpenStack, um, what parts of this are we using for this uh, application that we're building? Uh, well, of course, we use Nova to provision virtual machines, which is pretty obvious, and we also use it for OpenBZ containers. Um, we use OpenStack Common pretty heavily inside Red Dwarf. We use it for our REST API. There's a lot of good bits there that you can pull out if you're creating a REST API. And um, we use it also for the RPC communication. We use OpenStack Common RPC, which does all of that stuff for us. So. It's pretty cool because we get bug fixes for free by updating the, late, the latest uh, OpenStack common code. Um, HP uses Swift for securely storing snapshots, um, which you know, if you need to upload something to an object store, you know, Swift's there and it, it works really well. Uh, we use Keystone inside the API so we can uh, have user permissions on the different objects. We just use the Keystone middleware. And we use Glance so we can store the images um, that have the agent baked in. Yeah, so one of the other points here is that you know, we have a management API and we have a public API. So Keystone comes into play as far as you know setting the right role, setting the right you know permissions for the different APIs. So Nova is a building block. Um, I think maybe a year ago, uh, well Nova's really made a lot of big strides in the last year. It's a lot more stable than it used to be, and it's stable to the point where you can sort of uh, bet the farm on it. You can build an application on top of it. Um, when we first started, we forked Nova because we wanted to have, we figured that there were certain things we wouldn't be able to do if we didn't make it a fork. There was different code paths that we wanted to have to you know, communicate with it. And in some ways, there, there is, of course, more you can do, and there are some things we miss. But these days, you can get plenty of information through the API, and I think you know, having unforked it has made it much easier to work on the app. Um, so uh, yeah, another thing is to, that you don't have to use Python to work with uh, Nova. I mean, it's the HP's having a great experience using Java. Um, and because it has a pluggable architecture, we're able to sort of use Nova even in ways that uh, are very different. Like using OpenVZ is, of course, the best example. That's something where we figured we'd have to sort of write this provisioning engine from scratch. And uh, being able to plug the OpenVZ driver in has really helped us there. OK, uh, so you know we use Nova a lot. We use um, uh, OpenStack a lot. So we've learned a couple of things along the way. Uh, one of those is notifications. You know, uh, there's a lot of stuff that ha actually happens when you boot an instance. There's a lot of events that go back and forth, and at this point, you know, there isn't a really easy way to get those notifications. And if, if there was something like that, it would help you know build applications on top of Nova that you know could react to failures, react to events um, much more quickly. 
uh, HP is deployed in a cross AZ environment. Uh, we have like three AZs in each region. Uh, one of, and we've also deployed Red Dwarf in all three AZs. So one of the issues we found is, you know, across these AZs, things are not actually shared. So things like keys, security groups, you know, everything you have to provision, you know, you have to duplicate all of your provisioning in both, in every single AZ. So if there were some way to actually get some of that, you know, some of those resources to be shared, it would help, you know, build more robust applications on top of Nova. Uh, resource cleanup, uh, you know, Nova is distributed, it's async, um, things fail, uh, you know, th th there are, you know, opportunities for implementing fault tolerance, so things like reconnecting to, you know, RabbitMT, things like cleaning up things that are stuck in between, you know, ideally there would be some better handling of that within Nova. Uh, transactional state management. Um, Nova is async, Nova is distributed, and it's hard to implement transactions across distributed systems. So, you know, booting an instance uh, takes a, it, there's a lot of things that actually happen when you boot an instance. One of them is booting an instance, creating a volume, and uh, attaching that volume. If any of those things fail, that instance is useless as far as the database is, con is concerned. So, ideally, there'll be some support for, you know, uh, rolling back things that are you know, partly uh, completed. So either I get everything or I get nothing, and Nova or something should take care of that. And that same story goes for the long running job support. So some system, whether it's a Nova, whether it's you know, in with an OpenStack somewhere, should allow us to you know, submit a ticket and say, okay, you know what, I want you to do these three things, and let me know when those three things are done. And if, if, nothing, if something fails in between, I want you to roll everything back. Yeah, and that's something that could be from an OpenStack common or it could, could right. be another project, but it's definitely something OpenStack hopefully uh, will gestate. Um, another thing is we w really want better error messages. So we have a management API in Red Dwarf as one of our extensions, and when something goes wrong, on the Red Dwarf la layer, we, uh, we can call the management API and it'll tell us, oh, the volume didn't provision. Uh, it would be nice to have sort of a similar functionality in Nova, uh, where if, like, for example, the volume failed because the driver had some issue. We could, from an API, actually get that information back. Uh, right now, there's nothing that's that's that nice in Nova. Um, they've, they're, I know they're making strides, but it'd be really cool if we had that available to us through sort of some sort of API, so we could actually query the Nova API and return that through our management functions, and admins didn't have to go searching through different log files to find it. Um, the other thing is that if we could get uh, better traceability when we go and do create calls, where we maybe don't necessarily have the ID, ID back, uh, that would also help us um, just you know figure out what went wrong quicker. Um, and finally, OpenStack Common, if that could be packaged in some way, uh, right now we're sort of copying in files, and I think, I know there's talks going on this summit to make that uh, more efficient, but um, that would help us out a lot. So, so where are we headed? Um, you know, we have a, uh, a roadmap as far as the feature set goes within database as a service, and we want to support you know things like master slave. We want to support things like automatic failover, right? We want Red Dwarf to do some of these things for us. So what, what's lacking at this point is is this orchestration layer thing that can. What, what I want to be able to tell Red Dwarf is, hey, go create me a master, go create me a slave, and configure each one to talk to one another. And if everything anything fails in between, I want you to roll everything back. So we're trying to build that sort of a layer within Red Dwarf, uh, something that can do transactional-based uh, long-running uh, processes. Uh, scheduling. We also have features that we want to build, such as you know automated backups, automated upgrades of your instances. Um, we want to build in some sort of a scheduling support within Red Dwarf so we can do these sorts of automated tasks. Uh, language binding. So we already talked about Python Red Dwarf client, and we talked about jcloud. Um, those two, one of them is available today. jcloud will be available soon. But what about Ruby? What about the you know OpenStack Java SDK? So we, we have some work to do as far as getting Red Dwarf to be embedded into some of these other environments. Um, CI. Uh, so you know back in I think it was the last summit it was when Stack Forge was for uh, informally or formally launched. Uh, we want to you know put some effort in getting Red Dwarf into Stack Forge. We want to you know we want it to actually be part of the OpenStack CI process. And what that means is we probably would have to uh, do things like write dev stack extensions. And Rackspace has actually started some of this work with uh, what they're calling Red Stack. So uh, the other things are like Tempest. You know, we want to make sure that our tests are run along with the rest of OpenStack. We want to test Red Dwarf with the tip of you know Nova, with the tip of Glass, with the tip of Eclipse. Uh, the golden image. So you know, Red Dwarf and database services they're a little bit different from the rest of OpenStack. 
in that there's a guest agent, there's a MySQL, there's all these things that are actually baked into the image. But we want some process that can actually, you know, automatically create this image and test changes to the code base and, you know, run, run the integration tests that are required to verify that the, uh, the agent and MySQL and everything is uh, functioning properly. Okay, so how are we planning on getting there? Um, first off, we'd really like to focus more on community building. Um, we'd love it if we had more contributors, uh, especially if people in this room want to pull down the code and start making uh, pull requests. Um, and to that end, we're going to dedicate a resource to doing stuff in the public. Um, so the, if anyone's familiar with Mike Bassnight, he's going to start actually working more on pu pushing stuff to the public soon. And uh, you know, typically, OpenStack is a two-step process. Uh, you can put code in the open, but you also need to really work to push it back. And I think where we falter a little bit is on that second part, and Mike's hopefully going to help us there. So we also need to reduce the learning curve. Um, Red Dwarf, as it stands, isn't that hard to, to uh, use, but it, you need someone to teach you how. We have a little bit of documentation. We need to add a lot more. We need to add tutorials and make it easier for people starting from scratch to be able to pull down this code and play with it. Um, and we also want to make sure that we're following sort of OpenStack best pra practices, uh, just so we can be more aligned. So things that are, is, are happening on Stack Forge, so when people pull stuff down, uh, it's a very, it's a common experience. They're sort of used to all the different steps that it takes. And finally, I think everyone involved with Red Dwarf would love to see it get into incubation. So we'd like to start pushing um, to have that happen. Okay, so on the team right now, we've contributed to Nova a little bit as we've been doing uh, Red Dwarf, just so you can see that this experience has sort of given back to OpenStack a bit. Um, and then, of course, we have contributors to the Red Dwarf project itself. Uh, most people at Rackspace have contributed to the public. Uh, Vipple's contributed to the public uh, branch as well. And so just so you see that there's work going on in the open right now because of this project. So if uh, you want to get started with this today and pull it down and sort of run your fingers through the code and figure out how it works, um, you can. And you don't necessarily have to install the whole thing. You don't have to have a running installation of Nova. Um, what you do is you go to uh, HTTPS github.com hubcap uh, reddwarflight.git and you clone that into your, your machine, your laptop that you've taken with you to the conference. And then if you have Tox installed, which um, you're going to need to figure out how to do that, but you're going to want to run uh, in the bin directory start server.sh. What that's going to do is actually going to start running Red Dwarf locally on your machine. Um, and it'll, you'll be able to hit the API. And what it does is it fakes out the Nova pieces. This, this was one of the big advantages of not forking Nova, is it sort of uh, fakes Nova. So it fakes Nova in the guest response. And we use this um, extensively for testing, but it's also useful just so you can see how the API reacts. Um, I know there's teams that we've given this to in Rackspace uh, that uh, need to write like a GUI over uh, Red Dwarf, and they can actually run it locally and they don't have to set up all this stuff. And it's a, good, it's a good starting point if you just want to see what the code's like and how it runs. And if you're feeling really ambitious, you can also um, clone our tests. And there is a script inside the test directory called run local that will prompt you for the path to Red Dwarf and also for a path to uh, Python Red Dwarf client. And it will run all the tests locally. So if anyone feeling bored tonight and doesn't want to go to the party, why don't you set this up? <laughs> Should be more fun. So. All right, so if you want to get more information, um, we have uh, our Launchpad page. We have the different repos. Um, we're always hanging out in Red Dwarf, pound Red Dwarf on IRC. Um, there's the original blueprint for the public API, and uh, it's in the wiki, too. So at this point, I'd like to open the floor up for questions. OK. So, uh, you, you mean which Nova are we compatible with? Which Nova are we compatible with? Yeah, so. Pro right. Probably not Vexar. So, we, 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 we're running it against the Nova client that's designed for Epic. So. Yeah, and we're right now we're on Pulse. Well, oh, we, we'd love to. I mean, I mean, so as a developer, we, we'd love to, right? It's exciting. Um, 
So Mike Vastnight at the last summit gave a presentation where he had branched off Red Dwarf Light and he actually was, uh, he was setting up Apache as a service. And I forget, he set, he set up two other things as a service where he made an API where it basically did the same thing. It would just launch the guest and the guest would just install something else. Um, so anyway, I mean, it's, it's very possible. Um, we're just focusing on MySQL. We'd like to get that solidified right now. Why not Juju? Well, I mean, that's a good question. I think it's very lightweight. And so when we, when you get the image, right, it already has MySQL on there. Um, it uses like app get to update MySQL and it's using a guest that's very, very small. So things like Juju or Puppet or Chef, uh, we could have used those. And I think that's a good solution for a general, maybe if you're trying to make like an orchestration layer that can just put absolutely anything you'd want to on, an on a uh, server, that would work. Um, we really want this to be about you get the you get MySQL and as little other stuff as you possibly need. So you are just paying for MySQL. Yeah. Okay. So at Rackspace, we connect to Volume, and Volumes are actually we make them mandatory. So there's a flag in Red Dwarf Light that you can flip on or off. And we actually, the way we're configured, you always get a volume. So we're using, yeah. So we, we actually do use, in HP, we actually use the volumes API. So we create a Nova volume and then we attach that to the instance. Yeah, and that's not something you have to do separately like in Nova. It's actually part of the server or the MySQL instance when you create it through the REST call. Um, it's the volume size and it, it hooks it all up for you. Yeah, so when we create the instance, we also provision the volume. And uh, similarly, when, when we delete the instance, we destroy the volume as well. So, yes, the log actually, I believe, stays on the volume. The way we have it configured. So, yeah. It's on the roadmap. So HP actually has this implemented. So we have a snapshots API where you can create a backup. You can you create an instance from that backup. Uh, the plan is to actually get that into the reference implementation of Red Dwarf. So we're, we're a little bit ahead in our internal implementation and we're trying to push these changes into the public implementation. Yeah. Resizing, so um, right now we do support resizing um, for the volume and for the RAM. We don't offer any tools per se, although I know it's possible to run certain performance tools um, and you know, figure out the performance of an instance. Okay, so you're saying that we use different virtualization strategies. Uh, I think it just it just falls down to how we decided to run the products, right, and how we're deployed. Um, so, I mean, when we started uh, when we started database as a service, the idea was that we were going to be running OpenBZ, and we sort of knew the gear we were going to put it on. And I think, I mean, when you guys started, it was you had a big Nova rollout. Yeah, we already had Nova there. with you know. Yeah with the KVM hypervisor at that point. So we wanted to put something on top of that. Yeah. Y you mean in Horizon? That would be cool. Um, n we haven't worked on that yet, but it would be neat. We have, we have different uh, GUIs planned for both products. Right now we have something in reach at Rackspace. I'm sure there's some. Yeah, we, we have a GUI at HP in the works as well. But it would be very nice to have something on Horizon, uh, but we have to get to incubation first, or else, you know, they, the Horizon people would have really no reason to accept uh, pull requests with Red Dwarf stuff. Yeah. yeah. You know, I really wouldn't want to.
to say anything right here. We have, um, um, I know on Rackspace, we had a Rackspace blog entry that had some numbers that showed, it was, it was pretty fast. But, um, Basically, I mean, it depends. The fact Red Dwarf is um, configurable enough that it depends on how you're rolling it out, right? Uh, it depends on what Nova is provisioned to do. Oh, at Rackspace? Okay. Um, yeah, we don't, at this point, we don't have any published numbers. We have some uh, work being done to actually get those, and I think the plan is to actually just go out a blog post for that. Right. So at Rackspace, we've done some metrics, and I can't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but it's pretty fast. Because, uh, you know, OpenBZ on top of the gear that we're running, um, it, it beats putting it in like a cloud server. So. Any more questions? Yeah. Uh, no SQL. Like I said, uh, the core of Red Dwarf, we could probably offer other things as a service. Um, you know, as a developer, that's kind of exciting. Uh, in terms of right now, I mean, we're focused on MySQL. And I think something more like Post, well, I mean, we're not working, uh, I don't know what we're gonna work on next, so I don't want anything to be misconstrued, but something like a um, SQL database would sort of make more sense. Uh, but I mean, we could really run anything on top of the core Red Dwarf code base. Um, right now, we're, f we're simply focusing on MySQL. Absolutely. Yeah, we. Yeah, um, when Mike gave that presentation last time, I think we felt that maybe the re the reception was a little lukewarm, and so we're we're focusing on uh, MySQL, uh, just getting that available publicly, because I think just explaining it, people sort of see, oh wow, you could probably launch other things. But we probably want to push that publicly before we start um, branching in and doing other services. I wouldn't say so. I think Puppet and Chef, they're, they're a lot richer, right, in terms of what they're doing. Um, I mean, this requires an agent that is sort of tailored for the app. Now, you know, how hard that is, it, it depends on each app, right? For some apps, I think it's fairly, I wouldn't say it's simple, nothing is simple. But I know that um, you know, our lead was able to set something up that would provision Apache. Now, how good of a service you could build that would provision Apache using this is up to the app you build. So another way to think about it, this is if you are a company and you're launching a product, right? you'd probably want to go with Red Dwarf because Red Dwarf, is, it's all based around MySQL. So it's not just sort of, you have a server and then there's Pub and there's all this other stuff and you're giving people sort of a collection of you know, the server and then hey, you can provision whatever you want. This is MySQL, like you're, it's, um, it's tailored around MySQL. And I think uh, what Red Dwarf does better, I can, well in my own opinion, which is biased, than other sort of platform as a service things I've seen is that if you're trying to offer an app as a service and make it very SaaS, I think the approach from Red Dwarf, it works it's going to feel very good, like it's gonna feel unencumbered, um, if that makes any sense. Yes. Um, not particularly, I don't think, yeah, for the actual like Red Dwarf project, no. I don't know, Daniel, do you want to answer that?
that that was um, the architects who came up with the idea. They looked at the performance, and they decided OpenBSD was going to be much faster. So. Okay. Any more questions? All right. Thank you. Cool, You've thank been you. a great audience. Thank you very much, guys. That was a great uh, tag team by uh, HP and Rackspace, and uh, one of the better QA sessions we've had. There's only a 10-minute break until the next talk in this room, and the next talk is on uh, 